I was raised religious, weird religious. I was Kimmy Schmidt, any character from the movie Saved, or Pete Holmes from HBO's Crashing. When I was in elementary school, I would go door to door to invite people to church. I even started a prayer club in my junior high. Every Wednesday for years, I was part of a program like Boy Scouts, except we would learn Bible verses to earn plastic jewels to put on a plastic crown. Then I was in youth group when I got older. Every year around Halloween, we'd perform a drama called Destiny House. For this, we would decorate the Sunday school rooms to be the setting of different scenes in a play, and the audience would go room to room with us and watch us as we told a story that always involved two teenage deaths. I would hack out a suicide using a gun with blanks every night right in front of people's faces, like 10 feet away. And then the audience would go with our characters to heaven or hell, and we would try to convince people to convert to Christianity. I was on staff at a church camp for four to five summers. I wrote a Christian novel. I even acted in a cable Christian sitcom. I went on countless mission trips to Mexico and once to the Middle East. I attended four or five different churches in my day. I was on staff of three of them in one way or another. I knew as a young teenager that I was meant to be a pastor. I was a youth pastor for a few years. Then I got my degree in Bible, met a girl from church, got married, had a son, and everything was on track until I found out that my wife had an Ashley Madison account. She was cheating on me. Our church got involved trying to help, but they were devoid of empathy and only operating with black and white rigid interpretation of the Bible. It became clear that they wanted her to be someone she wasn't and they wanted me to be someone I wasn't. I took her back three or four times, but the marriage was doomed. When she filed for divorce, the church instructed me to beg her to stay and apologize for anything I ever could have done to make her want to cheat on me but I refused. I had enough. Two days later, they told the church on a Sunday morning to treat me like an outsider. I was disfellowshipped, they called it. You would call it excommunicated. I was kicked out of church after years of being the poster boy for young Christian men. I even tried to go to another church, but the leadership contacted them and warned them about how dangerous I was for questioning their authority. In the middle of all of this, my best friend passed away from sudden heart failure. He was healthy, and he wasn't even 30 years old. Oh, and one more thing. This whole time, I was gay. I knew I was attracted to guys since the age of 14, but I knew because of my beliefs, I could never act on it with anyone. And I was open about my attractions. My pastor knew, my friends knew. Hell, my ex-wife knew before our first date. After I got kicked out, I spent some time away. I came out, and I felt like a thawed-out Encino man. I put myself in therapy, I read books, I read articles, and I walked away as I am now, a non-believer, a religious, secular, out and proud, and people in my life lost their shit. Soon I realized that I had something called religious trauma syndrome. Religious trauma syndrome is defined as the condition experienced by people who are struggling with leaving an authoritative, dogmatic religion and coping with the damage of the indoctrination. Even though I'm out and free, the past still creeps in. And it wasn't just from being kicked out of the church. It was every time I was expected to believe something with blind faith. Every time somebody would do something hurtful or even break a law, and we were encouraged to look the other way. Every time I was expected to believe things that defied logic. Every time homosexuality was taught to be a choice and disgraceful, and I had to slump down in my chair. Every time I was made to feel like I wasn't good enough by those who were talking about grace and acceptance. Every time I thought I was deserving of hell just for being born. And every time my faith was used against me to follow orders. And the list goes on. One of the syndromes of RTS is a loss of social construct and community. Once out, I found myself socially awkward and unable to relate to normal people. I thought I was alone until I started looking around. The people I grew up with and other up-and-coming Christian leaders were walking away from the faith too. People are leaving religion in record numbers. So to help find more pieces of myself, I'm going to go to them to hear their experiences. I'm Brady Harden, and this is The Life After. Hi, I'm Chuck Parson, and I was raised in the evangelical church, literally from age zero. At age 12, I remember sitting in a room listening to a worship song on repeat. 
The song was the hyper-popular evangelical worship song, I Want to Know You by Sonic Flood. I experienced a powerful rush of emotions in that moment, and I remember thinking to myself, this, this is what life is about. This is what I'm going to spend the rest of my life pursuing. And pursue that is exactly what I would do for the next 13 or 14 years. I was raised very conservative, like I was homeschooled conservative. Like I went to an Alan Keyes rally conservative. Oh, you don't know who that is? Exactly. Think Ben Carson, but in the 90s. I went to a private conservative evangelical high school, which I actually chose to attend on my own volition. In 2004, I volunteered for the George W. Bush campaign trail. I was in leadership in my youth group. I played in the worship band. I set time aside to pray and read my Bible almost every day. My social life revolved around my church. I went to church every Sunday and Wednesday and most Friday and Saturday nights. I would wind up hanging out with church friends. I was in a Christian hardcore band and we would play shows around town and tell people about Jesus between songs. But after high school, I started to figure out that the conservative scene just wasn't for me. As a result, I started to question my faith, which was hard because my entire life revolved around it. But just when I was about to call it quits, I stumbled onto a book by Donald Miller called Blue Leg Jazz. This book would become wildly popular among millennial evangelicals, and it would change the trajectory of my life for the next 10 years. Donald Miller was a Christian, but he was also a liberal. I began to realize that the version of Christianity I was taught growing up had almost nothing to do with the teachings in the Bible, and I wanted to start from scratch. I started delving more and more into liberal Christian authors, Rob Bell, Gregory Boyd, Shane Claiborne, Anne Lamott, George Barna. I would pore over footnotes and appendices looking for the next book to buy. I spent hundreds of dollars on commentaries that explored the cultural context of scripture and I started developing my own theories and interpretations. At one point I was seriously considering moving away to attend a prominent liberal seminary to continue my studies. Fed up with a lot of the toxic culture I was seeing in various churches I had attended, I would eventually start a house church. I made a video announcing the launch of the church that went semi-viral. I had people from literally all over North America contacting me and watching as the church was born. The first week, nearly 50 people showed up in my mom's basement, which probably doesn't sound like that much, but you have to understand that at that point, I was just a regular college kid with no platform at all. That house church would continue running for two years. After suffering from a serious bout of depression my senior year of college, I stumbled into Christian mysticism after learning that just sitting quietly in what mystics called contemplation seemed to be the only thing that was helping my depression. I started reading all of these ancient Catholic mystic writings and I started to realize that all of my study of theology and the language and the cultural background of scripture was just the tip of the Christian iceberg. Medieval writers like John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and Julian of Norwich seemed to have answers to much more difficult questions that evangelicalism couldn't answer. I had once again found a new path in Christianity. But eventually, one very memorable day in February of 2014, the very bedrock of the Christian life I had so meticulously built would fail, and the whole thing would come crashing down. That was the day I realized that in spite of everything I had done for God, I felt God had betrayed me. In 2010, I had gotten married at age 22, which is super young, but in so many ways, getting married was my biggest act of faith in God. I loved my wife, and my marriage meant so much to me. It was the non-negotiable, the one thing I could never sacrifice, and I still think that's a noble proposal. I would sell my house and all my stuff, and I would move to remote Africa and become a missionary, leave all my comforts behind if God asked me to, but my marriage... That had to stay, and that cold day in February was the day I realized that my marriage was going to end and there was nothing I could do about it. And I was right. It took a while, but eventually my marriage did end, and I felt that God stood by and watched. It was easier to believe that there is no God, or maybe God is indifferent. I grew up believing in a God that is there in your most desperate moments and who offers help when you feel like you have nowhere to go, but I realized that that God is made up. That the idea is comforting, but ultimately had a negative effect on my life. And that I had a whole lot of mess to unravel. But my journey doesn't end in a mess. After a couple of years of aimlessness and wrestling and finding things I could believe in again, I find myself here and the life after. More whole than I've ever been. With a bigger smile and a free heart. I'm here to help people who wrestled and suffered and struggled like I did find their way. When I left the faith, I was afraid I would find that there was nothing outside of those walls, but I ended up finding everything. And I want to tell that story. I'm Chuck Parson. Welcome to my life after. That's my friend Chuck. I met him over 12 years ago when he started a band with some of my friends. When I went on my journey away from religion, he was already well on his way. 
When I started this project, I knew I had to reach out to him. Finding somebody who understands the subculture that I came from is hard, but I knew Chuck would get it. The books, the music, sermons, shows, all of it. And after I told him about the life after, we decided he'll be joining me as my co-host after this episode. Here's my conversation with Chuck Parson. Chuck, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me on. This is great. I mean, I like I, how you say have, having me on. This we're in your we're in your house, right? Yeah, we're yeah, recording in your true. house. And also, I'm technically will eventually be the co-host, but I'm just a guest today. You're just a guest today. Yeah, I've been. No, it's like um, it's kind of like you're a Pokemon, and I'm just now putting like you next to your <laughs> your moonstone, and now I'm, you can. I'm going to evolve. You're going to evolve. This is my moment. You're like an Eevee now, but tomorrow you'll be a. Before, moon yeah. Eevee. Yeah, I, I don't know. Moon I, don't, Eevee. I don't know any of these things. I don't know You're any of these things. You're over your head, Brady. Um, uh, we don't believe in Pokemon because uh, we were raised in, in church. Yeah, we weren't allowed to watch that. Actually, yeah. I did. I, I did was. Watch that. I was allowed to watch What shows it, were you not allowed to watch? They talked about evolution, so it was... Yeah. What, what other shows were you not allowed to watch? Uh, Captain Planet was a big one. Very liberal. Yeah, it was super liberal, but they also said the big thing. This is what my parents told me. Uh, he said the power is yours. Oh, okay. The power is God's. That's baby. interesting because it reminds me of um, a lot of people didn't like the Ninja Turtles for their children because Master Splinter taught like yoga and kind of like oh, oneness right, and stuff right, like that. Right. That's interesting. Um, if I remember this correctly, tell tell me if I'm wrong. You were homeschooled. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What I was, was that homeschooled. Like? I, um, not only was I homeschooled, but I was an only child, and I was homeschooled. Oh my goodness! So I was like, uh, I mean, I, you know, I had, like, I had like neighborhood friends and mm-hmm. stuff like this, so I was I wasn't like totally socially isolated. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and my my neighborhood friends went to like you know, like real kid school. Um, so your living room is a real school. Don't <laughs> don't sell yourself short. I mean, yeah, and your mom in the yeah. back of curriculum. Hey, you know my uh, my we I had a great time hanging out with my mom a lot, and we had we had a lot of fun, and it was good. But yeah. um, that's what every homeschooler says. It was yeah. I mean, it, no, I love that's hanging not, out with mom. No, 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 that's not what they mostly say. Actually, <laughs> true. most people don't have that many nice things to say about it. Um, but yeah, no, I was I was homeschooled in um in uh from uh first through eighth. Nope through ninth grade all the way through ninth grade um and then i went to a christian high school um but yeah i was uh it was actually interesting uh i figured out later on that i i have a hard time identifying loneliness as an emotion because i was lonely oh wow all the time when i was a kid like a, not all the time because i had it's like friends. A, a water like a fish doesn't feel wet because it lives in water exactly yeah, oh, yeah man yeah. that's so that's so like emo that. no yeah it's pretty intense right? i love it I but love I, it. it wasn't honestly until my 20s i couldn't identify the the feeling of being lonely of like what it was i did i thought i was never lonely until i realized i was pro- i was lonely like a lot because i was just by myself um, I was one of those. I was always around people. Like I had a lot of acquaintances and stuff. I went to pri- uh, public school. Uh, all all of my years was public school. I had a lot of people that I was like well known, and I, I had a lot of like acquaintances, but I didn't have any like real friends. And so that was like a a long term thing for me of mm-hmm. like praying for like good godly Christian guy friends and all that. Right, right, right. What were yeah. some of the memories that you had of home school that kind of like helped shape your Christian walk? And- yeah, yeah. So it was a, it was a definitely a uh, a conservative Christian uh, homeschool scenario, right? Okay. Uh, so the I think the goal, and I you know I don't want to speak for my parents, but I think the goal was to like keep me out out of like keep me from like being exposed to more more liberal or more like like evolution or like at least not uh at least to to analyze those things critically as a as a creationist instead of you know just being like taught evolution as fact or something like that or like so your starting point would be on a christian thing and you were just learning mostly how to defend that is that fair to say yeah 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 definitely and uh, uh i think i feel like uh science they're like the approach to science like also keeping me out of trouble uh like you know drugs and sex and all that yeah, stuff absolutely. all that bad stuff and uh and then like politics i think was a really big part of it was just like not being exposed to and with their mindset politics. and with their belief system i you know you have to give them some credit like they were doing what they believed yeah was it the was, best thing. Yeah, was the best absolutely. thing for me which is you know i, I appreciate that Absolutely. For sure. I don't agree with it anymore, but I appreciate it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like they, they were, they're being loving people, you know? 
Um, I, a lot of my textbooks were were uh, Becca books. I I mentioned Becca curriculum a second ago. Did you hear it? No, I missed I it. It joke. went over my head. Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> it's out of out of Pensacola, Florida, which is one of the most conservative places in the yes. world. Yes. Okay. There's a Christian college down there. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, because Pensacola that, Christian College that has segregated. Sidewalks, sidewalks between male and female i think they do that at pensacola i know they do that at uh at bob jones oh for gosh sure. that just sends chills around yeah they have yeah Don't, no purpling do you for know, sure you know purpling no uh like red and red and pink oh, or blue and, blue and pink yeah, together yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes purple no purple and, that is uh, so interesting no for purpling. you brady no no deep blue no deep blues <laughs> Cobalt, get out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, no midnight. No Heter- heteronormative blue. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So here you are, young, young Chuck, mm-hmm. going through your your homeschool days. Yeah. Um, how you're telling me how that how that shaped you of that your your family really you know did all this stuff to keep you away from all of this. Do you feel like your education was very, very swayed in one way or another, or just kind of like, hey, we kind of hope that you come to these conclusions like we did, <laughs> or how how was that for you? Like, right, right, right. It was, uh, yeah, it's very, very biased curriculum. Like, like, um, I think, I think if a, if there's like a homeschool mom in this room, she would like snap back and be like, well, you know, public school, you know, is biased. Their curriculum is biased too. Okay, but okay. I would say this is like way more biased okay. and way more like there's, you know, like a, a high school science textbook has like, you know, 50 names associated with it of people that have done research that like, you know, plugged in stuff that goes in those okay. pages. Whereas yeah. like, to find, you know, there's, there isn't a, a large demographic of people that are defending intelligent design or something. So can ham. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you end up with <laughs> one person. Yeah, no, you just end up with, yeah. Like one person okay. has written something or yeah. like five, <clears throat> you know, <throat> and they all go to Pensacola Christian college, you know what right, I mean? Like right, something right. like that. Uh, so or yeah, they live it's, in, it's in way... Noah's Ark in Kentucky. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the life size model that didn't make as much money as they were hoping. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that absolutely. That is 100% the culture that I was, okay. that I was in though, that very, uh, that Noah's Ark, like, uh, yeah, Ken Ham, um, like, can build these irrefutable arguments uh, to defend intelligent design or something like that. Um, actually, it, it, when I was in middle school, um, I was a part of this. I, I was taking a class that was for homeschoolers, and uh, I had to write a, a paper. And I don't really remember exactly what the guidelines for the paper were, but I ended up writing this paper on, uh, on like, why America is a Christian nation. Oh, wow. Or like, yeah, like why, uh, this is like God's, like why the founder, I guess why the founding fathers intended this to be a a Christian establishment in the United States. Other than the fact that like how many of the founding fathers were, were just right. Right. I mean, there isn't a whole lot of evidence that many of the found, there were definitely founding fathers that were Christians, but the main ones, you know, like, Benjamin Franklin, you know, you can look up online. There's a, there, he wrote a letter to his nephew where he's explaining how to solicit a prostitute. Wow. Thomas Jefferson, like the, uh, the Jeffersonian Bible, he like took it, his just Bible took chunks out yeah. and he just cut out portions <clears throat> of like, like if it was supernatural or something, hmm. he would like cut it out, you know? Um, and there's really no, uh, they actually, actually several documents were refined several times. So that would be very, not like it was so it was very clear that it was not religious right like that any reference to faith or religion or denomination or whatever was not meant to imply christianity right Hmm. and then you have thomas jefferson's famous letter uh where he's he mentions the separation of church and state and we have all of this evidence right but there's this author named named uh, david barton who's like pretty he's a pretty prominent figure in that community and still is to this day um and he has devoted his life to fi- like researching documentation to prove that the founding fathers were in fact christians and that they uh, established the united states to be a christian nation that upholds christian morals and beliefs and uh yeah and i wrote i I essentially plagiarized the guy like i read (laughs) one of his books or like skimmed one of his books and then i i read i listened to one of his lectures 
and just sort of like took that and said like, Hey, look, look at all this evidence that we have that this is a Christian place. Right. Interesting. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, so what is the motivation of that? Do you think, I mean, I've noticed like a big, from my, where I was brought up, I was a very conservative Southern Baptist. Um, I went to a mega church and you know, the suburbs of St. Louis. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's where I went till I was 19 years old. But I really recognized uh, there in other places like this, this deep need of having a very patriotic, um, like meshing of Christian culture and, and American culture. Yeah. Um, and it, it starts, it starts to get a little weird. In fact, you know what, Chuck, and I, I hate this. Um, there was, I vaguely remember towards the end of my Christian walk, there was a pastor that I heard at a convention. Um, and then I later on found out that he did a sermon where he talked about how, slavery was almost a form of missionary work that they be, because of that the yeah. certain people were able to hear the gospel and i'm just floored by the audacity yeah, of that yeah, yeah ignorance of course it doesn't represent all christians but that is no 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 that's pretty extreme that's insane that is but, so yeah insane. i mean honestly like uh like some <clears throat> of the like i definitely not like my own parents are like my dad's black so it's like mm-hmm. that i don't that would be outside of you know what he, i think he would embrace as a, as a politically well, obviously but, right but like i think i don't think it's far-fetched to say that there are probably people in the community that we were a part of that had that kind of that kind of extreme like not intending right. to be racist like they're trying to defend christianity or say that they're trying to make something good out of something bad but uh definitely like that's not that far-fetched for that kind that's of that's insane yeah Okay, a piece of trivia about you that I remember um, is that you were very much into the end times. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was the that was the, again the culture was like really, um, especially. Did you take like a class the, of it in homeschool? Like end times one hundred one. I didn't or something? take a class, but like uh, it was like my my dad owned a bunch of like left behind like books <sighs> movies Those were left my behind favorite. right. But uh, yeah, no, it was it was um, super normal for. Like my my dad had like movie like not even the left behind like there were other end times yeah, movies. Yeah, the Omega made, Code. The Omega Code. We, I watched, I that, watched that so many times. Like I watched that movie so many times, and mm-hmm. they were like really really low budget, like really bad ones that we would that we would watch. There was one time uh, I had this girl over that I liked in like eighth grade, oh, and it was like yes. it was me and this my friend that my dad didn't like, and her and like maybe one other person, <laughs> mm-hmm. and we were all just chilling doing middle school hangout stuff just having a good time and he like made us watch one of these <laughs> and it was it's so bad mr was like... t was in one <laughs> it might have been the one with mr t have I you don't seen know. that one uh, i maybe. totally watched I I that one. what it was called but... i don't even remember what time in my life i would have watched that but... stuff because i feel like i had some class yeah 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 but i've i i must have thrown it out the window for one weekend or something it was so it was it was so bad mm-hmm. like in the like just the writing was bad but also like i mean even like in college i would learn that theologically i disagreed with it radically yes um and i would learn like alternate interpretations of revelation and stuff mm-hmm. like that and then but in all seriousness uh it uh like there's this there's this belief that 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 like events that are happening in the world are leading towards the rise of the antichrist and the return of of jesus right absolutely and those like that is the filter through which a lot of conservative christians yes. view modern politics okay i think of this all so much of the fact that and even like in my personal life so it's like this whole belief system of the left of, of the end times has really affected me on a lot of different levels but what i've always caught myself doing is if things are going well or they're getting better I feel uncomfortable because in my mind, mm-hmm. the time frame is well, everything's supposed to go to shit mm-hmm. and then the world ends. Right, right. And so I like right. have this distrust yeah. of like like politicians that have good points yeah. or that seem good because I'm just like, oh yeah, hidden behind all of that good stuff they're saying. Right. You know, Bernie Sanders is probably going to end up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Having a, like, a yeah. barcode on him or something. Right, right. And then he wants all of us to get it tattooed on us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like shit like that. Because insane, so that right? we can make purchases with our socialist nation state. Yes. Like, uh, yeah. Ugh. So, so uh, you know, Christians take this, like that sort of, that's like a really monumental thing to like just drop into a worldview. It like, it displaces all of your, your like sort of critical analyze, analyzing of politics, right? Or of what somebody's saying. Or what you know, like you're seeing it through that or filter. what you actually might actually think is mm-hmm. good for the progression of humanity, 
because we have because ultimately like we might as well like nothing needs to change because pretty soon Jesus is going to come back and depending on what you believe destroy the world and we all go to heaven or restore the world. Do you think maybe part of that is um why some people are so reluctant to grasp onto things like global warming, climate change, things like that even I though the evidence is there. I think that makes it there, a lot easier. A lot easier. A lot easier to d- to deny. I think it kind of goes back to like a self-fulfilling prophecy thing where uh, the, the mindset is, you know, if we're going to look at the future through these lens that everything's going to go bad, then it almost becomes that we proactively or subconsciously create some of those situations mm-hmm. that yeah, have yeah. the wars and the rumors of right. wars and all these different things that um, it kind of creates what we want it to do. And we're writing right. that and story. I mean, like right uh, uh, John Hagee, uh, oh, God. You know, who, yeah, right. There's a yeah. name I haven't heard in a hot minute. Right, right, right. Yeah. A, a, a charismatic uh, leader who is one of the few, actually, interestingly, I used to work at a, at a Baptist bookstore and he was one of the few charismatic Authors that, you guys that they carried okay. mm-hmm. because of his commentary on the end times, and he would release. He releases an, a new book like once a year because he needs to like update his interpretation of that's interesting what's happening in the Middle East. So yeah, no, it absolutely. It, it's not. He's not predicting anything accurately. I mean, he's been saying the same thing for like thirty years, but he's just updating it to fit whatever's happening so i worked at a christian bookstore too but we weren't baptist so we allowed uh-huh. everything yeah yeah yeah. oh yeah uh, but you know speaking of end times uh we are not at the end of this interview yet right Chuck. uh <laughs> but we do need to take a break and when we cool. get back i want to talk a little bit more about what it was like for you leaving your faith and how that journey looked like right cool so we'll be right back after this The Life After Facebook page is a great way to get in touch with other religion survivors. Also, we like to post interesting articles on there. And it's a good way to get a hold of us. And you won't need a concordance to find us. (laughs) We We have a link to the Facebook page on our website, thelifeafter.org. Or search The Life After on Facebook. Finally, you could just go to our URL, facebook.com slash thelifeafterorg. Welcome back. Um, before we get into you leaving the church in your exodus, I mm-hmm. do want to touch on what, what exactly did your church life look like? What was your belief system? Yeah, Everybody's yeah, a little yeah. different. We all have our own little fingerprints. Right. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a fingerprint. It really is. Because uh, my mine is so bizarre. It's like really all over the place. Like I, I've, I've got a quick summary is that I was raised in a mega church, like a non-denominational mega church. That was it wasn't quite like Joel Osteen level ridiculous. Okay. Like okay. it was it had some legitimacy to it, but but it was uh it, it was a big... like good life advice and stuff like that at yeah, least. Yeah, yeah it was good. It. It was okay. good. I, I still I to this day still respect the the pastor of that church. My mom still goes there. It seems like a you know functional community, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went to a small Baptist church cause, of, cause of the, uh, I got plugged in with the youth group and it just felt really at home there. So I started going there, which was, you know, not my parents' church. So I started like a, in, in high school, I started going to my own, I started making my faith my own bit of in a lot of ways. So it was I like, you. I feel more comfortable in this community and I feel like I grow more from this. So I, I left, you know, I went through that phase church. when I was like 19, I think. Did you? Totally. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that was when I was like probably 15, 14 or 15. You're always ahead of the curve with uh, me. Yeah, no, I'm, you know, One that's my ahead. whole goal is to just be <laughs> ahead of you at all times. Uh, yeah, so I went to a I went to a Baptist church for a while. Um, I still am, am good friends with a lot of people that I met there. Um, I eventually, uh, in college, I got plugged in with a different youth group that I was like more of a, in a counseling position. And, uh, so you did multiple youth groups. I did too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I kind of went around. Yeah, right. Yeah, I bounced around a lot. I went Southern to a Baptist. charismatic youth group for a while, just really? like briefly, awesome. sort of okay. in the middle. Um, that was that was real crazy. It was just I just liked the girl that went there, so I went there for a summer. You Can know. I ask you a question? Didn't work out. Yeah. Did you ever speak in tongues? I did. Yeah. I did too. Well, in high I, school. I no, did. You know, I mean, like. Uh, with without the presumption that that speaking tongues is not a real thing, which I no longer believe that it is, but right, right. Um, I you know I was actually thinking about that experience the other day. Um, I like we had I was at this youth camp and it was very very intense and charismatic, and uh, there was this portion in the like it's very important in this particular uh, sect of of char- charismatic 
you know because a lot of them put different emphasis on it like right, so, right. so you so have to like do it very to be saved. important for you to okay. speak in tongues in this it wasn't like you were saved if you speak in tongues but it was like you're not getting it until you speak in tongues so okay. they had this this portion of one of the worship services where they they you could like go up to the front and, and be like i would i would like to be baptized in the holy spirit and speak in tongues yes and they would pray over you uh like really intensely and like say all these like really like charismatic things mm -hmm. like in the you know the the spirit of God is blowing over you and like all these like really insane and, and things. For listeners and then they who, would actually like physically blow on you. And for our listeners who have never experienced any of this, like these, I, I've been in that experience as well as a youth group. Um, mm -hmm. They're right there. And it's a very like very personal, intimate. Very, very intimate. They're in your bubble. Very much so. Yeah. And it's, um, I don't think it's purposeful, but it is very almost kind of manipulative like emotionally it and is yeah yeah and i think i think sometimes it is <clears throat> purposeful i don't think I in think this right, particular actually. case that it was yeah unfortunately but i th fortunately for me it wasn't in that case but in a lot of cases i think it is and uh yeah and then and then there it was actually like there was this moment where like this guy expected me to start He's speaking right. in tongues and i didn't because i just assumed it would be automatic like i wouldn't be able to help it you know and he said you can start speaking in tongues now Oh, and wow. I was like, oh, and then I just sort of started making noise. Is... Exactly. And here. like, yeah. so speaking in tongues is a big thing for my mom. Cause she was like, when she really embraced Christianity, when she was like in her twenties, I think she was part of a charismatic church and that still is a really meaningful thing for her. So I told my mom that I spoke in tongues like after that, that trip. And it was kind of like a big thing for us, but I always was like questioning, like, well, did I really speak in tongues? Cause I just sort of started doing it because a guy told me to same here and i did mine a lot of times in private but i still walk away thinking did i create those situations um because i think yeah. that it is I, obviously i don't believe in it but um i think it definitely was something that i was a, a situation or a environment that i was creating for myself to have a certain experience you know mm -hmm, what i mean so mm -hmm. it's kind of like i set it up subconsciously yeah. and yeah, then yeah. walked into it as like oh wow yeah. this is so enlightening but it really wasn't you know another thing that was really interesting about that experience was that was was watching other kids like friends of mine mm -hmm. imitate the leaders yes yes and i've even seen like little little kids do this and people like pass yeah, around on yeah, facebook yeah. like it's cute and i'm just like i don't know well, i'm uncomfortable this is, like this. feels very brainwashy you know yes very much so um, yeah, but it's like very nuanced like mannerisms and things that aren't like hey we're following a bible verse here it's hey right. we're part of this culture yeah, yeah. we've created for and it's ourselves. not even like that person wouldn't do that if that other guy didn't just do it so was that kind of like the last i don't want to use the word phase because i feel like phase takes away the no 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 no. there's that walk, was there's but... so much after that so i i uh i'm gonna try to keep it relatively succinct but um after like towards the end of high school i honestly went through a deconstruction phase where i um where i started to doubt my Christian beliefs and my okay. upbringing um, because of actually because of a class that I took at my Christian high school where we, where we studied different worldviews very in a very biased <laughs> it was very but it was like basically like we studied a worldview and then we would go back and say well but this is why Christianity is more true than that right wow but even so like a lot of the evidence that Christianity presented wasn't convincing enough for me so I was like I don't know if this is was true. there a specific worldview that they touched that was <clears throat> kind of putting these doubts in your mind no it was more like the collective like like the 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 collective evidence that they used to defend Christianity against a whole slew of different worldviews. At the end of the year, I looked back and said, like, I don't know if any of that is really convincing enough for okay. me. Okay, understand. So I went into college like sort of on the fence, and one of the first things that I encountered at college was was a uh, campus crusade, who just like kind of stumbled. I just kind of stumbled onto them. They were out in the in the commons. And they handed me, like, the only reason I interacted with them at all is because they had free stuff. So I, like, signed up for their thing or whatever, and they gave me, like, the, a bag of stuff that was cool. That Some of it I still have to this day, but in that bag was a copy of Blue Like Jazz by Donald Miller. I was going to say, this sounds like Donald Miller. I was thinking of his book, whatever you're describing that. Of, like, it, how it's he's kind of, it's kind of a similar yeah. thing to him, yeah. right? Uh, so Donald Miller is, is, a, is a really influential writer in my life, and I, I feel like you know a lot of Christians know who he is. And he's pretty liberal. For the sake of, you know, we have listeners that probably don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's pretty liberal. He's a Portland-dwelling, you know, like... He was one of the he was one of the few 
uh, Christian authors at that time that had a, a wide audience that was like, like saying like, yeah, I curse sometimes and I drink and like get hammered with my friends and you have a good time. And, uh, also uh, you don't have to be a Republican to be a Christian That's and huge. like, yeah. this is my life experience. And it was more like, it just felt way more the way that he writes. And I still respect him as an oh, author I do to too. this day. Absolutely. He's a really good writer. That, yeah. He's a really good writer and a really respectable guy. And, uh, and he, the way he presented it was like, then now this is something that I can get down with and this resonates with me a lot and he was saying things that i was like thinking but he was like saying them better than i was thinking them one thing i always respected about him was his mentorship program uh where he didn't Mm -hmm. grow up with a good home life and a good father and i really related with that um and so what he does is kind of sets people up so they do have somebody to look up to and it's almost like a big brother big sister thing but it's just I know I have a lot of respect for that and for him. Through yeah, that. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, so, what was your next phase? What so, was the next so yeah, so that's like? when I started. That's when I started to learn. Uh, so, I read his other book called "Searching for God Knows What," uh, okay. which is it's basically it's basically all the points he hits in Blue Like Jazz, but it's it's uh, uh, it's more theological. More okay. there's more Bible verses. There's more like this is why I think this and, and such such and such. And that's when I started learning like, oh, there are interpretations of Scripture that I don't, that I haven't been exposed to at all. Uh, so that's when I started trying to dig and start looking into like background information. That's when I started getting into Rob Bell, um, who like is super controversial now, especially now he was Mm -hmm. then, but now like way controversial. So what I'm hearing through your journey a lot is the desire of keeping you isolated, but then the opposite happened. You started to see, more other options, more mm-hmm. uh, other worldviews and viewpoints. And that's when it really started to influence you was, mm-hmm. was being exposed to all these other ones. Yeah. And learning all ex- this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I actually became, and this is when I would say, this is probably when my Christian journey for me really becomes what it ultimately would end like, I okay. guess. Um, which is, I, I became a really big theology nerd for a few years really started digging into different like alternative interpretations of the Bible. Um, it wouldn't like not without, like without neglecting conservative viewpoints and see, and like sort of like juggling and seeing like, well, what do I agree with? What don't Where I? Where did you land? Um, I landed. So I would eventually, uh, I would even deconstruct like modern left evangelicalism. Mm-hmm. I continued to decon like from the point of leaving high school and leaving my Christian high school, I basically deconstructed most of the time after that. And, um, there was a point where I started it. I started a house church, uh, because I remember that, right, right. Because yes. there were, there, there were things that existed in all of the church bodies that I'd been a part of that I, that I viewed as really toxic. And I, I saw people around me thinking the same thing so i went once you do Did when you, you guys yeah. went to, you guys were yeah, in a yeah. park okay yeah, i think yeah, yeah. and i came for that sounds one. about right yeah yeah we usually met in my in my basement but you yeah, know there was a there were times where we would meet other places so yeah so I, I started a church for a while and that went that ran for two years wow yeah and i was like the leader of this church and then um i i joined this other church that was kind of similar philosophically where it was like let's not have this this like staunch this like hard line between clergy and and uh and you know lay, lay people. people yeah i hate that phrase lay people lay people it's weird um so ultimately i would i would leave evangelicalism almost altogether and i started becoming way more catholic because of exposure to christian mysticism please um, explain that to me that's so interesting yeah 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 so uh mysticism is it's like really it's really picked up steam in the christian community over the past few years but my personal experience with it um i guess i guess i could briefly try to define yeah mysticism uh, is is christian the new mysticism. is the new veggie tales yeah, taking <laughs> taking the christian take, community by storm, storm. <laughs> so uh after uh a lot of people date christian mysticism back to uh, this group of really radical, fantastic people uh, right around the time of Constantine called the Desert Fathers. Oh my gosh! And it was a it was a group of people who uh, they were they were known as as fathers and mothers, and they left uh, the city to live in the desert uh, because they saw what Constantine was doing to the church. Like Constantine was hijacking the church 
and trying to make Christianity uh, about the Roman Empire so that he could build an army if effectively. Like so many people at that point had become Christians that he needed an army. So he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. What were these people called again? Desert Fathers? Desert Fathers? Yeah. Two things. They could have called them Desert Daddies. It would have been a lot better. <laughs> Number two, actually, they were they were Abbas. They were referred to as Abbas. So yes. that, that's closer to Daddy than Desert Daddies. Desert Daddies, yeah. And all I can picture are the Tuscan Raiders from Star Wars. <laughs> they were kind of like that. <laughs> uh, uh. These people so think think John the Baptist. Like these okay. people were like radical outside. They were out. They left the the city because they didn't want to be influenced by the changes that were happening within Christianity. They so they became being, the representation of mysticism for so many people. They did. They they uh, yeah. They, they saw Christianity becoming politicized and they left and they, they just prayed a lot. They basically just sat in tents and prayed and people would come visit them and ask them for advice. And they had all these crazy stories about just just crazy stuff that happened. Like they would physically fight demons or they would like oh my tell people these extremely cryptic things, but it would change their lives forever. You know, like just really bizarre, crazy stuff. So what is like the basis of that of that belief system then? Like what were the big pillars that you held on um, to? Yeah, so uh, the summary that I usually like to give people is uh, uh, something that some mystic wrote, one of them, and, and a lot of them will like elaborate on this in different parts of their writings, but it's... it's uh, Illumination, purgation, and unity. So um, illumination is is being exposed to the goodness of God. Uh, purgation is is the process of in 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 mysticism, it's important that this is a passive thing. Okay. But you allow God to purge you of your you know, like whatever your sin nature or so he's whatever. the one doing the work and he's okay. the one doing the work and and that's through through contemplation. So it's more like this, this is like meditation and contemplation. There's this huge emphasis on, uh, on quietly sitting, um, on negating your own thoughts, like literally just trying to, to lose your, your train of thought and just be present with God. And then the belief there is that just being in God's presence is sort of like, how when I spend time with you, I become a little bit more like you. Like we, scary. we learn things from each mm -hmm. other, right? So is it scary? Well, yeah, my, yeah, my hair, my I, hair is getting cur curly. I don't think I can learn. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, you're getting a little browner. Um, <laughs> you said it at me. So yeah, so the idea is that just by by passively passively spending time with God, not letting yourself get in the way okay. of the process of being with God, is sort of uh, what what advances you and then unity is just is learning to be one with God at all times. So that was your, that was your last That step. was very important for me because I, in my last year of college, I went through an extremely still to this day, the, the worst bout of depression that I've ever dealt with. Wow. And my way out was before I knew anything about Christian mysticism was sitting in my room quietly and just trying to quiet all of my thoughts and, and, and pray that way without like, actively saying words to God, just sitting and listening and just being. And that was when I started to heal from that depression. It was really so, important. So it, it's still life. something that you look back at and you're like, I'm glad I still, that I went to this day. Yeah. It's not, it's not uh, such a prayerful thing, but meditation is a very important part of my life and it, it keeps me on track. And that's where I like Christian mysticism is where I started to learn that. So that was a really big part. And then uh, some of the, the first like father figure besides my own dad that I had a, a really hard time letting older men into my life, like mm -hmm. being open with anybody that's older, not just men, but anybody that's older than me. So I didn't have a lot of like role models. Um, and one of the first people that, that really r was a role model to me that I felt comfortable opening up with was my friend, Joe Rogers, who I still have a good relationship with. Um, uh, and that was through like, I started, I felt ass backwards into mysticism and then I met him and he was like, Oh, this is what you're, this is what you're doing. Like, this is what you're talking wow, okay. about. And he started giving me like books to read and like of these, like, you know, these authors from the 15th century that had all these really impressive, like, and just unbelievable things to say. I always tell people like where, as far as depth, evangelicalism ends way above where mysticism starts like okay. mysticism just jumps into the deep end that most evangelicals i don't even think realize exists it's like 
super intense stuff. It's really interesting. So if this, this, <clears throat> you're still speaking about mysticism and this belief system as if it's a very positive thing in your life. It was. And it's great. And it still so is, yeah. at what point did you start having this shift yeah. of saying, hey, I can't really consider myself a Christian anymore. Right. This was your your last step on the stepping stone uh, before you got to dry ground to, and yeah. to atheism or whatever yeah, however yeah, yeah, you yeah. identify yeah. now. What what happened? What happened? Yeah, so uh, that's that's a really good question. Um, and it is, uh, like, mysticism gets pretty deep into, like, uh, like interpretations of scripture get, like, real kind of, kind of, wishy-washy which always like sort of bothered me about it sometimes it did sometimes it didn't um but at some point i was like reading the bible or like you know thinking about the bible and i was like how much of this book can i disagree with before i just don't believe what it teaches anymore okay. my beliefs are still based in this book if mm -hmm. not loosely at least you know we at least like have to embrace the story of the resurrected Jesus to be a Christian. Right. Right. Um, and I still embraced that, but it was like what I'm like throwing out huge chunks of the old Testament. My, you know, some of my, my close friends are gay and I'm like reading these verses about sexuality and I'm like, this doesn't match my experience. I disagree with this or, you know, more logistical stuff. Like can somebody survive three days in the belly of a whale? can the earth be created in six days or, you know, and you, you know, there are all kinds of nuances to that. But at some point you have to say like, there are large chunks of this that I don't think are true. So does that make the rest of it not true? And that was, that became too hard for me to, to balance, you know, eventually it just sort of teetered over. So I kind of have a similar story with me uh, towards the end. I started to question a lot of those things. And I think that the way that I, I explained it to myself for a while is that I thought of different parts of the Bible as different genres of writing. So, you know, you've got some things that are obviously like uh, Genesis and everything. I started to believe, well, these aren't really historical. These are more of just stories that we can pull truth out of. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if a very conservative by the book, you know, black and white Christian were to read the book of Genesis and they walk away. Oh no, well God, you know, made the earth in six days. The, the, the moral of that story is that they believe that God is powerful. When I read it in thinking it was a different genre, mm -hmm. Right, and I still walked away with the same belief system, but from my experience, um, there really wasn't that much room to have a differing view on how to interpret certain scriptures in the church environments that I was a part of. Uh -huh. yeah, um, yeah. Cause mine was a lot more black and white. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't do the whole mysticism and everything. We were staunch, you know, staunch Calvinist. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe the word or you don't, you know? And so it's, it's interesting for me to hear you kind of like going through that period of like, you know, mushing arounds of like really trying to figure out what you believe and what you don't. Mm -hmm. Um, cause there really wasn't much room for me to be able to do that for right, a while. Yeah, yeah. I, I did it secretly, right? you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. uh, but, but, asking the, the same but when you're doing you it secretly, it's still only, you can only get so far from home before you have to turn back. Right. You know what I mean? Like you, if you don't have somebody, somebody else to sort of bounce ideas off of, Absolutely. you, you, you don't really wonder that far from, you know, where you started am i right like is that no absolutely yeah. absolutely um and i was always one that was very cautious about how far away am i getting from what you know, i thought was true before and uh there's a lot of insecurity of me kind of going into like the wilderness and exploring right, yeah, other yeah. you know ideas yeah um we do need to take a break when we get back i do want to hear what your final straws were and on top of that, I want to hear what life is like for you now, um, your, your life after religion, and to kind of get a gl glimpse of how things have influenced, if things from your past have influenced your present, and uh, just where you are and where your walk is now. Uh -huh. um, so cool. right after this, we'll be right back. Do you have a story you want to tell us? Or a question you want answered? Do you need advice on how to handle family members who are upset at you because you're wrestling with your beliefs or leaving your religion? Have you experienced some weird religious shit that you need to tell people that might actually get it? Then contact us. Go to thelifeafter.org, all one word, and click the Contact Us page. Or Facebook us at facebook.com backslash thelifeafterorg. Or email us at info at thelifeafter.org. We would love to hear, hear from... Let's do it together. Okay. One, two, 
three. We'd, We'd love, love to hear from you. you. Or when you email us, send us a voice recording. We really like that too. And we're back uh, here with Chuck Parson. We're discussing, wanted to hear what your last straw was before you left. And then I want to touch on what your life is like now here in the life after. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, so yeah, the, the last straw um, was definitely coupled with what I was just saying about, you know, can you believe this system? How much uh, of the Bible can you not believe? How much believe of the Bible can you, you not yep. believe before you don't believe the whole thing? Um, the other thing was, is, is like a really, uh, deeply personal thing for me pro uh, still to this day, uh, you know, and, um, is my, I was married for five years and, uh, yeah. that marriage didn't work out. Um, and that was the moment where I decided, like, I no longer identify as a Christian, uh, was the moment that I realized that my marriage wasn't going to last, or it wasn't going to last much longer. And it wasn't even like we we weren't having that conversation even at that point. Mm -hmm. Like the word divorce hadn't come up between us. Uh we hadn't we weren't fighting. It wasn't there wasn't anything on the table that was like that I could point to and be like this is, you know, like this is the sign like this is marriage is going to end. It was just like I I understood the direction of things. Like I, I had this you. moment of clarity. And it was like, this is going to end unless something dramatically changes. What I hear you saying is that your last straw was kind of a one to hit. There was something very logical. You're reading the Bible, asking yourself, how much this can I not believe before mm -hmm. I say I don't believe any of it? Um, and it also something very ex experiential and something mm -hmm. very close to really personal and emotional. Yeah. So both of those things together, I th I'm drawing a parallel to that to my in my head. Mm -hmm. The moment that you said that, I'm thinking to myself, that's how it was for me. That mm -hmm. I was going through all these doubts, very logical, but then also the situation of um, going through my divorce. Mm -hmm. Um, by now my wife was cheating on me, the church getting involved, their horrible advice and abuse that I went through, um, just the crazy things that they told me to do and were mm -hmm. trying to manipulate. Um, that all at once was kind of what it, yeah. you know, I've, you know a, what, I've got to give myself credit. It's sort credit. of a perfect storm you have to, yeah. Absolutely. But I have to give myself credit that it took a lot. It took a mm -hmm. lot for me to finally say, no, I'm done. I don't believe this way anymore. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. um, cause yeah. it might even happen after that where I was, I came out as, as gay after my, after my divorce. Um, and I, and I said that I was a gay Christian and I was mm -hmm. a practicing gay Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, and even tried to hold on, hold on to that for a little bit, yeah. but then it just kind yeah, yeah. of, it fizzled out. It's such a painful thing to, to leave mm -hmm. that. And like, I get, there's, there's a lot of fear, uh, and there's a lot of sort of aimless. I mean, there was like a solid year of my life, I would say, where people would ask me what I believe. And I would just sort of be like, nothing, <laughs> everything, you know, yeah. like, I don't know. Like I was just really kind of adrift. And yeah, yeah there's, there's a, I, I, you know, there's this fear that sort of like, you're going to be this, you're going to have this like prodigal son scenario where you're like, oh, I know what I'm doing now. I'm going to leave this. This is a bunch of bullshit. And then you go out into the world on your own and fall on your face. And then you end up, you know, begging to come back to the, to the church or to your, you know, yeah. to God's house or whatever. You know what I mean? Like there's that fear, like that's, that's sort of, and that's, yeah. Did I mean, you, you know what I'm, you absolutely. I never, yeah. I didn't come back though. No, I didn't either. I, yeah. Obviously. No, I mean, that's why I we're didn't here. Either. Are we <laughs> still, so still make us prodigal sons? Do you have to come back to be prodigal? No, I think we're just, we kept on going. Yeah. You know, and we, we found ourselves at this other place. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's interesting to me that, that yours also involves a divorce mm -hmm. and your situation was different. Um, all of them are different. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but one thing we have in common that I really do appreciate is that we get along with our exes mm -hmm. and from my background, just to give you a yeah. little bit of background of how it was for me to grow up, I grew up with, uh, my dad was a deacon mm -hmm. and he cheated on my mom with a coworker. And uh, was very abusive physically, um, not very physically. He was abusive at times uh, physically to my mother, <laughs> but also very much like emotionally and verbally abusive. Yeah. Um, it, it, it just despicable stuff, you right, know. Right. And so in my mind, divorce is this horrible, ugly thing, and there's no way in hell that you're going to get along afterwards. Yeah. Whereas yeah, yeah. with my experience with my ex-wife, uh, we have a son together, and we 
we work together for him and right. we realize yeah, yeah, we yeah. can put our differences yeah, yeah. aside. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. And, and that's why I say that, oh, um, our church wanted her to be someone who she was and they wanted me to, she was just as manipulated and, and, and mm-hmm. pushed around by them as I was, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. and, and also with you, I'm friends with both you and your ex-wife, mm-hmm. uh, and you guys get along and there's still like a healthy we friendship relationship there. We still hang out all the time. Yeah, yeah. We still, we still talk. We still, Do you I literally th- just text her. She's having trouble with, uh, with calculus homework. I was like, you can do, you got this. You know, like yeah. <laughs> if it was me, good it, yeah. it would have been a lie. If you yeah, texted yeah, it to no, me, you, I would have. I, I, I would have known you don't got it. Yeah. <laughs> but but she is good. She's you know, good. she she's knows what she's yeah, doing. She's cool. Do you think that it would have been possible for you to have that sort of friendship with an ex-wife if there was still all of that religious pressure? Mm, that's a good question. Because I think that one thing that comes a lot with that religious pressure is, is the blame game mm-hmm. of really assigning blame and shame to um, whomever, whatever party is, is, yeah, you know, the well, guilty yeah, and, one. And, and, and not to that. mention like the, the sort of like, and God bless all the people that, that helped me, you know, through the, the divorce process and like through my whole relationship, through our mm-hmm. whole relationship that we had. But like, there's this like pseudo counseling that happens in church a lot, yeah. you know? Um, and it's, sometimes it's really helpful for people. And sometimes it's like, my situation was just horrible. Not so ho- yeah. Yours was a nightmare. Yeah. I remember two things that they told me. Um, and I want to share them with you. One was, uh, I found out that when, when I found out my wife was cheating, I, I yelled at her. And they, they reprimanded me and said that a Christian never, uh, never has a reason to raise their voice so that I got in trouble for responding the way they did. And the other thing was, um, I was brought up in a household that we would do, we would do statements like this instead of like, Hey, you're pissing me off. I'd say, when you do this, I feel this way. That Mm -hmm. was how I was raised. Mm -hmm. So when I said the, I feel this way things, they told me, Brady, when you talk about your feelings, you sound weak and you don't sound like a leader. Wow. This was yeah. the wow. same month that I found out my wife is cheating. I was fighting for <laughs> and they custody have the of my audacity son. to call that counseling. And my best friend had just died from sudden yeah. heart failure. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was just, yeah. it was so unempathetic. Extremely and, heavy handed. But the advice you got was better than that. I'm hoping. I, yeah, it was. It Good. was. Good. It was not that bad, but it was still like, uh, a lot of it was sort of unqualified, you know? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, we talked about this not in this context, but um, would we have gotten married if it wasn't for the religious pressure? That's almost me, what me I would you. ask you. Me and you. You know what I mean? Yes, you and you and I. <laughs> Chuck, are you proposing to me? I didn't. Well, I just I wanted to wait for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, like what? Like like we we both got married. Yeah, and to some degree, if not mostly, mm-hmm. because there's this religious Absolutely. because in Christianity, you, you know, there's this, there's this idea that you, you get married. You know what I mean? I, w- like, I would not it, have gotten married. Um, and I, because I, I wouldn't have either. I was gay, you know, right, yeah, and, yeah, right. and I was open about it, yeah. you know, but yeah. I, I was legitimately, I was legitimately attracted to my ex-wife period. There's no mm-hmm. question about that. She was beautiful. Um, I, she still is she, just, but I'm gay. You're right. gay. And so right. because I didn't have the ability to explore that yeah. growing yeah, yeah. up um, or to do any, which I feel like I lost a huge part of my youth. You know, I'm, oh, yeah. I, I was totally good looking in my early 20s, right. Chuck. <laughs> right. You know? Um, yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. It, you would have slayed out there in the. Slayed out there with the gay. On the, on the grove or whatever. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that was kind of my experience is, is I don't think I would have gotten married to her because yeah. I would have been able to explore this other part of me. Um, what about you? Yeah, um, I, yeah, absolutely would not have gotten married, I don't think. So you felt that and pressure it's nothing as well. against, yeah. It's nothing, nothing against, against her. Ex, she's amazing. Yeah, she's absolutely. Great. She's awesome. Like, we had a really good time together. You guys had a great friendship. We did. Yeah, we had a really good friendship. But I, there was, uh, because of, I think... Actually, yeah, I think because of uh, like Christian sexual ethics, probably is what ultimately killed our marriage. Because we, we both, at least I, I don't, I can't, I, I don't know, I can't speak of her by any means. But uh, for me, it was like I never, I never took the time to question like not only like do I is this somebody I want to spend the rest of my life with as a as a friend? Yeah, she probably matches that criteria. But like, 
is this somebody I want to have a sexual romantic relationship for the rest of my life? I didn't ask that question because it's not, I was programmed to desexualize myself. Yes. Until I was, until after I was married. So there was a huge degree of trust there. So I think when we talk about last straws, um, I think, uh, the, the big reason that my marriage failing was so personal and was the thing that tipped me over the edge is that, uh, it was, it, it was a violation of my trust that I had with God. Like if God was a real person and I, trusted him in like going into this marriage and and saying like okay like this like i don't know i don't know if this you kept your part of the bargain up but he didn't i did yes yes and that was that was the last straw it was like i did i followed the the ethical code like we didn't have we didn't have sex until we got married yeah neither did i yeah yeah which is a terrible idea horrible idea. in in hindsight i realized that was Chuck, I was so bad at sex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so bad. And you just don't, even, you know, good or bad, you don't know what you want. You don't know what they want. You don't know how to. Like, is your pastor going to be upset that you're doing certain things in the, you know what I mean? Like, like how far is, how far is too far? Like what's, all that goes through your mind. is a mess. Because it was so, it was, it was put on such a huge pedestal. It's on, it's on a huge pestle and there's an incredible amount of pressure mm-hmm. and that damaged my marriage tremendously, actually. Um, it damaged my sexual performance. Yeah, right. That, yes, that was the biggest risk I took with God was getting married mm. because I was a sexually charged 22 year old. I was, uh, this you is got like married a whole at 22? Yeah, I got married at 22. Oh my God, I didn't realize you guys were that young. Yeah, yeah, we, we were Little really young. She was 23, I was 22. And uh, yeah, we babes. And I was I was like, you know, everything in me was saying like, you know, I don't really, be- I don't know if I believe that, that I can settle down now, you yeah. know, having never even had sex with anybody else. But you like, moved you moved forward. I moved forward with this like incredible amount of trust, like knowing that I was a very, very, very sexual person. So I felt the same with my logic side. Yeah. Of when I went through my logical doubts is I would I, I felt these doubts coming up and it would be like, Hey Brady, mm-hmm. I don't know if that really happened. You know, I don't mm-hmm. know if that Bible verse really happened. I don't know if that happened. And you just kind of like you push it back down, mm-hmm. you know, and you say, Yeah, I, everybody has doubts. And if you talk to another Christian while having doubts, they'll give you the same speech of like, oh yeah, everybody goes through this. Everybody goes, mm-hmm. but you just, you just, you step out and you have this faith and you mm-hmm. just keep going and mm-hmm. you fake it till you make it. And that's, yeah. And that's kind of like what it yes, sounds like you, with my marriage you really and your do marriage. fake it till you make it. Is that we're questioning, oh my God, is this really the smart thing to do? And mm-hmm. you're like, well, we're just going to keep going because it, because we are promised that that was the right thing to yeah. do. And that's what we yeah. should have done. You know, when I, when I started, when I was started talking to people about like, I might be leaving the faith. Mm -hmm. Um, I heard from more than one person. They basically said like, well, you're just upset because you're not getting what you want. Oh God. Yes. And it's, it's not, no, I got the same thing. It was an intense betrayal of trust. I was very personally hurt. If, if, if God was a a human that I could see or like a family member or something, I wouldn't speak to them anymore. I mean, it was like a really personal thing for that for my marriage not to work out, I felt like God, I felt like I was trying to meet God halfway on that and, and say like, look, I'm doing my part. I need you to pick up at this part because I know this aspect of our marriage isn't working. And I know that there's nothing that I can do about it anymore. And I know there's nothing she can do about it. Mm -hmm. And I just got crickets, you know? And it was like, this is ridiculous. That was the same for me as at a point I had to just accept that this wasn't going to happen. You know, our marriage wasn't going to get fixed. Yeah. And I had to learn how to be okay with that. What is my next step? You know, how, how do I re- recover from this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because being as somebody who was brought up in a broken home, mm-hmm. you know, that was the last thing I ever wanted for my son. So it was heartbreaking. Uh, but I wasn't just going to like stop and give up. Mm-hmm. You know, but what one of the things that, that you said that I really, 
um, relate with is I got a, from a specific family member and some of my friends had this attitude of like, oh, well, life didn't go the way you wanted to. So you're mm-hmm. walking away from the faith or, yeah. or you weren't strong enough as a Christian or any of this. And and I, and I think that was so absurd for them mm-hmm. to say that. Um, because I knew the things that I went through and I knew my mindset. I, I was brought up in a, a pretty bad home life mm-hmm. and that did nothing but strengthen my faith and all these things strengthened my faith until the end. And it was not an attitude of, oh, well, you didn't get what you wanted, so you're going to walk away from God. It mm-hmm. was that my understanding of God was completely turned around on its head. It, f- it failed. It failed. Um, a friend of mine at her work had a, had a situation where her boss did not stand up for her and put her in a really bad position. So when they had a meeting and people were kind of like um, coming after her, the boss just kind of sat there quietly and allowed it to happen mm-hmm. and didn't speak up. Mm-hmm. And when she told me that story, I I, I cried that night mm-hmm. because I stopped and mm-hmm. I thought about that's what it was for me, mm-hmm. that these people were coming back and saying things that were not true about me. And they were accusing me of these things of like not wanting to work on my marriage and not doing all of this and, yeah. and all of this. But, but really at, at the heart of hearts, what made me the most mad was that God was sitting right next to me, allowing it to happen yeah, yeah. while his yeah. people were tearing yeah. me apart. And he just sat yeah. there quietly. Right. And that's when my understanding of the Holy Spirit started to change uh-huh. because I thought to myself, how could the Holy Spirit be the real? How could he be living in me and in these other people mm-hmm. if they're behaving this way and treating me this way yeah. when the truth should be so obvious to them? But that's when, so when I stopped believing the Holy Spirit and then I stopped believing these things and it all kind of like was a snowball effect. And it was not as simple as, oh, I didn't get my way, so now I'm going to walk away from the faith. Mm-hmm. And to treat me like that and to treat you that way felt insulting yeah 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 it felt really insulting right uh we do need to take a break um right after this can you stick with us for one more segment i sure can thank you chuck um i wanted to talk to you after this about what your life is like now yeah and uh really get into the life after yeah yeah stay tuned if you were gonna die tonight do you know where stop just tell them about our website Oh, just tell them to go to the lifeafter.org? Yes, they can go now, even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> the lifeafter.org. We have a blog, contact page, a link to our Facebook page, and more. All right, the lifeafter.org. Heavenly. Hey, and we're back. Uh, I'm here with Chuck Parson, and we're at the part of the interview where I want to talk to you about what your life is now after religion. What is that like? Yeah. Uh, But one of the things that I came across, and I want to ask you about this, is I I learned this phrase called religious trauma syndrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we defined that at the beginning of the show. That's something that I, I, I was exposed to when I went to, through therapy and started reading articles and books of my own. And um, I, I show a lot of the symptoms of it. I, I didn't realize it at the time, but uh-huh. I, I started to show them and working through those. Uh, one of the ones for me is um, I'm very socially awkward at times. I don't know how to relate with like outside people, yeah, yeah, you know, like yeah. normal people who grew up in normal ways. Um, also, like cognitively, I've realized that like I had like, like a blur of depression and like inability to really process things logically uh-huh. for a couple of years after leaving the faith, I right, think, right, right. Uh, yeah. if not like a year. Uh, what about you? Did you experience any, anything like that or what, how did your like being brought up in the Christian world affect you now and how you think or how you process? Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Um, like it's, just to clarify, like necessarily negatively or just in general? How about just in general? Okay, cool. Um, Actually, let's start with the negative, then go to the positive. Right, right, right. Because there's um, always going to be positive yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still don't know if I'm completely comfortable with my own uh, existence as a sexual human. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm still not sure if I've if I've come to terms with that. Is there still like lingering guilt or? I, I don't know if it's, I don't know if I would call it guilt anymore. It's more like, uh, it's more like a thing of like, uh, like they're in the back of my mind, the back in the, the tiniest little cobwebbed corner of my mind, Christian sexual ethics are still the right way. Mm-hmm. And I, I relate with this when I stray from that, there are these moments 
it's not really guilt. It's just like, oh, you're going to wreck your life. Yes. You know, like you're on the wrong path. You're giving out so many parts of your heart. Right. To all these different people. How are you ever going to love again? How is anybody going to accept you for yeah. not being a virgin or, you know, right. sexually pure? To, absolutely. Yeah. I or I'm going to, well. I'm going to wind up like, it's like jaded and I'm never going to be able to commit to somebody Yes. or something like that because I've, you know, like been around a little bit. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I'm, I'm in the same you boat. Know, yeah. And you know, I think to this day, I think that a lot of people in my life want to view me as asexual because this idea mm-hmm. of like mm-hmm. me, you know, being more open sexually yeah. as a gay man or yeah, just yeah. even as a non-Christian. I would, I would assume it's hard for people. Especially as, as a, as a gay man, you probably Cause there's get more prejudice there and all people. that stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, what positive lingering things do you st- still see in you? Right. Um, I, th- I still think the New Testament is, is, a, is a very uh, compassionate document. I think it's, uh, I think the, I think the way that Jesus approached uh, poverty okay. and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, society's outcasts um, is like so important. And it, it's still something that I, I still don't feel like I'm good at that, at like, at like really reaching out and really having empathy and taking action to to protect and 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 help people in marginalized situations. I think I'm okay at it, you know, but I still yeah. I still strive for like Jesus level, I think. You know, and there's there there's a lot of the New Testament that I that I disagree with, but I think Jesus I think Jesus stood up for um whoever was not acceptable in the society that he was a part of. When I see you, I see you as a person who does that. And and I think that's you know, one of those things yeah. where you know what what we view ourselves is different than how other people view sure, ourselves. Sure, sure. But when I see you, I see a very empathetic person. Well, who's I hope so. You know, I mean, that's yeah. what I strive for. I don't know if I'm if I'm there or not, but. And I've always seen you with the outcasts. I, I guess maybe just because your friends are losers. I'm pretty cool sometimes. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I'm, yeah. I'm kidding. I'm right there with them. No, but um, but isn't that weird? Let's let's look at the juxtaposition of what you were saying before of of growing up in the homeschool whatever and mm-hmm. making these papers and everything and and politically how politics are tied into religion mm-hmm. and and vice versa mm-hmm. of how and how f- like free market capitalism and and like these very like not compassionate yes concepts are dr- are driving christian politics mm-hmm. even and, though and if jesus, jesus was, was here, the one that says like no you can't stone her because you've all done things that are bad mm-hmm. you know it's like how can you but, but you know what I think is beautiful is that even as you've walked away from the faith as you did and as I did, there's still positive things. Yeah. That oh, we hold absolutely. On to. Yeah, yeah. There's um, yeah. And I and I want to really reiterate that as much as we can because I know that uh, there are going to be Christians listening to this and and it 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 if I was in their shoes I would think, oh, they're starting this podcast just to bash how they were brought up and they're and to bash these communities and all of this, but in all reality that's that's not. not it's not really the goal. That's no, not the goal no, no, at all. no, it's, um, in fact, one of my, one what of my, is the, what is the goal? What's the goal? The podcast, Our goal yeah. is this. Um, I want to get people together who feel like they're alone and I realize yeah. that they're not. Mm-hmm. Cause I felt, I felt that I was alone and, and the, whenever I went through this coming out of the, out of the, the closet as an atheist, you know, uh, that was, that was hard. And I thought I was one of the only people our age that went through that. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, Oh God, I'm not like, there's you, there's Mm -hmm. so many of our other friends that we have that we're going to be interviewing on down the road. Um, and I'm also thinking of the people who are maybe starting to question their faith and having doubts yeah, and don't know how to deal with those, deal with those. And so the advice I want to give is to, to let, let them breathe. Yeah. And, and you're going to land, uh, however you're supposed to land. I agree. And yeah. just don't be afraid of doing that. And, and right. also the people that have gone through this, uh, I want them to be able to feel empathized yeah. with. And then finally the Christians that are listening, um, for us to be talking about these toxic environments that come out of church at, at first, when I first talked about it, um, I had people come, but they came out and said, no, that does not happen. 
Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as spiritual abuse. There's right. no such thing as religious trauma syndrome. Right. Like everything with religion is good. The people who are in leadership are good. That doesn't happen. Yeah. And of course, it's a very like extreme view, but it, it's a very popular view that your your first response is to defend what you believe in and what is important to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some people aren't able to get past that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so whenever I'm a non-Christian talking about, no, I was part of religious abuse. I was in toxic Christian environments. Not just the last church I went to, but the ones I grew up in, all of these. Um, it's real. Mm-hmm. And there, there are Christians that come to me and they they want to speak with me and say, hey, what can we be doing different to reach out to the LGBTQIAI plus. community or whatever? Plus, yeah. or, or what can we do for, for people like you who have walked away from the church? What can we do? And I'm more than happy to sit down and talk with them yeah. and to give out ideas yeah, yeah. because they're willing to listen. I'm willing to... Sure. And this is all context for that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why we're here. I think for me, uh, the big thing, like the, the, the big reason that I really wanted to jump into this podcast was, uh, was when I left the faith, there was this period of time. It's you sort you touched on it for sure, but there was this period of time where I was like, there's no book on this. Mm-hmm. I mean, there might be, I don't know what it is yet. Maybe somebody will tell me, but uh, there was no resource for me like that I could find. And I sort of, I, I looked here and there to find somebody that's like, I was up to my neck in Christian culture, theology. I was in this, mm-hmm. I believed it. I, you know, I sang the songs. I, I lived the life. I, you know, gave up freedoms for the sake of this thing. And I no longer believe it. And I'm in the desert right now. And, but this is how you get to an oasis, you know, like nobody, there wasn't, that wasn't there for me. You know what Mm. I mean? Like I, and I had a really hard time with that. Um, so I would hope that this podcast in some capacity is, uh, a place for people to like, listen and be like, I can identify with that. Yeah. I understand that. I get that. That's where I'm at. Or that's maybe that's where I'm headed or that's where I was. And I jive with this, you know, and like it gives them some life, hopefully. I want to leave that desert better than I found it. Yeah. And I want to leave, I want to leave my faith better than I found it. Yeah. And, um, I think for you to ask me, what is the purpose of all this? And that, that's it. I want to leave all of this better than I found it. Yeah. Um, and to be able to bring people together and you know what? I've already started learning, meeting new people throughout this. I mean, this is our first episode, but I'm, right. like people are flocking in and like having conversations yeah, with me that I've never I've met before. I've already met cool people from this. And um, just hearing their stories and realizing, wow, this is not rare. No. This is everywhere. No, it is everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. But I think that's a really good place for us to stop for today. Yeah. Um, so, so Chuck, thank you for letting me interview you. Yeah. Next, next stop, co-hosting. Hey, I'm honored. Yes. And then and then marriage. If you I proposed if I to me may. twice today. Come you on. Know, I hate man. I mean <laughs> if we're gonna do this, we're we gotta do it, you know? Absolutely. Like if like there's no half assing this podcast. Or or at least we can like settle and we can be like um Danny Tanner and Becky whatever, where they like <laughs> li- they <laughs> they were in separate relationships but they just lived in the same household with a whole bunch of other random adults and kids. Yeah. Okay. No, that's that's that, that sounds logical. Is that, right. that not marriage? Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, hang with us um, as Chuck and I go through on this journey of uh, interviewing our friends and new strangers, um, and just getting at the heart of who we are as people um, and finding what we have in common, um, and just leaving the places better than we found them. Thank you so much, Chuck, and I will uh, see you all soon.